Um, okay, so um, Virginie just mentioned um, the concern with being overconfident in technology, and uh, in many ways this is what our talk is about. So um, she set us up quite nicely. Um, and I think, sadly, Oscar will be largely in agreement with the things we say here. So, I mean, for better or worse. Um, we'll see in the Q&A. Um, so I think what we're ultimately defending is a weak version of what um, you call the pessimism objection. Um, so most people believe that suffering is intrinsically bad, and this yields an obligation to reduce or eliminate suffering, except when doing so would violate a more stringent moral requirement, um, or perhaps would be overly burdensome. Um, so we ought to refrain from causing suffering, and we ought to prevent or relieve suffering, except when suffering is necessary for the achievement of some sufficiently greater good. Um, say, in order to cure a painful condition, when training for a marathon, that's Nicolas' example, marathon runner, um, to promote some other intrinsically valuable moral consideration, uh, such as beauty, autonomy, or justice. Um, so this is the intuitive starting point, I take it, for the argument in favor of interventions to prevent wild animal suffering. Um, for the scope and magnitude of suffering in the world is clearest, some, including Oscar, uh, Dawkins, and Tomasic have argued, when we consider the lives of wild animals, if we accept the moral principle that we ought pro tanto to reduce the suffering of all sentient creatures, regardless of species membership, and we recognize the prevalence of suffering in the wild through disease, starvation, parasitism, predation, disproportionate infant mortality, and so on, then we seem to be committed to the existence of a pro tanto obligation to intervene in the wild to prevent the suffering. And this surprising conclusion, at least surprising to many who were first confronted by it, um, is sometimes called the problem of wild animal suffering. Uh, as Jeff McMahon puts the point, um, discussing, the predation, uh, discussing predation as a source of suffering in the wild, the case in favor of intervening against predation is quite simple. It is that the overall effect of predation is to cause vast, unimaginable, unimaginable suffering among its countless victims, and to deprive those victims of the good experiences they might have had were they not killed. Suffering is intrinsically bad for those who experience it, and there seems always to be an agent neutral, though not necessarily decisive reason to prevent it. Of course, as McMahon and others acknowledge, competing values such as aesthetic, scientific, or moral values values of species, biodiversity, naturalness, or wildness might be relevant to the all things considered case for or against intervention. Still, proponents of interventions to reduce wild animal suffering argue that even if we were to give some weight to such duties or such values, no plausible theory could, without undue partiality, inconsistency, or implausibility, resist the conclusion that wild animal suffering is overridingly important given particularly its disvalue and prevalence, as Oscar made a great case for it. Um, and wild animal suffering does seem prevalent. Uh, predation and reproduction are two of the significant sources of suffering in the wild. Um, uh, by some estimates, American bulls kill between 36,000 and 48,000 adult deer per year, um, often in brutal, painful ways. Uh, lions kill approximately 15 large animals per year. Um, and many animals have vast numbers of offspring, the majority of who die before reaching sexual maturity, often in gruesome and painful ways. Okay. Um, and there seems to be no doubt that uh, these are sources of a great amount of suffering. Um, there's a further question of whether that suffering entails that their lives are all things considered not worth not living, but um, it's hard to deny that these are sources of significant suffering in the wild. So, there have been many attempts to respond, well, many might be an exaggeration, there have been several attempts. <laughs> um, when you're a philosopher trying to think of something new to say about something, you think there are so many attempts, all of the attempts have already been made, right? Um, to respond to this problem, while avoiding a moral commitment to massive interventions in nature. Um, in making these arguments, authors have appealed to uh, rights and species-specific flourishing, um, 
uh, Regan and Everett are a couple of examples of these folks. Um, they've built distinctions between negative and positive duties in relation to dependence and vulnerability. Um, Claire is the fourth uh, version of that kind of argument. Um, appeals of, uh, to commandingness have been made. Um, appeals to sovereignty and group membership rights. So Donald Trump Kim with that might be one example. Uh, um, but in this paper, we set aside those replies. Um, and unlike existing responses to the problem of wild animal suffering, our focus is on the deep epistemic problem with interventions to prevent suffering. So we can see that suffering, because it is intrinsically bad, gives us a moral reason to prevent it where it occurs. In other words, we accept the claim that if we could intervene in the wild to prevent suffering without risking ecological disaster, then we should. Um, however, we argue that the indeterministic nature of ecosystems leaves us at present and, the stronger claim is, for the foreseeable future, with no reason to believe that large-scale interventions in the wild that have been recently proposed would reduce rather than exacerbate suffering. Um, so other authors have discussed or acknowledged this concern. Um, indeed, Oscar acknowledged it yesterday. Um, uh, but the extent of the epistemic intractability associated with some proposals to prevent wild animal suffering has been more often set aside than it has been explored. So we're going to try to explore it in this paper. Okay, so the talk is composed of four parts. <coughs> in part one, we consider two technological interventions that have been proposed as holding promise to prevent wild animal suffering, uh, reprogramming predators, and reducing the fertility rates of species that reproduce using the R strategy. In part two, we raise some epistemic concerns about these interventions to prevent wild animal suffering that derive from the complexity of ecosystem interactions and the effect these interactions might have on the resilience and integrity of ecosystems. Because ecosystem resilience and integrity bear significantly on the well-being of the biotic community, um, we argue that we are not justified in believing that interventions to prevent wild animal suffering will prevent rather than exacerbate suffering in the wild. And in part three, we discuss the moral costs of interventions to prevent wild animal suffering. Um, we argue that technological interventions to prevent wild animal suffering um, pose a certain threat to values attached to species, biodiversity, naturalness, or wildness. Therefore, if we take these competing values seriously, um, we have weighty reasons not to intervene to reduce wild animal suffering. Um, given that we have no reason at present to believe that such interventions would actually reduce total suffering in the wild. Um, second, um, oops, not yet. Second, uh, um, the person, governmental, or non-governmental entity who deploys harmful interventions to prevent wild animal suffering does harm. Wild animal suffering is something that we that would merely be allowed. If doing harm is morally worse than allowing harm, this is a further powerful reason not to intervene until we have a great deal of confidence that intervention will lead to a great reduction in that suffering. And in part four, um, we briefly consider a way forward. We suggest that to justify interventions to prevent wild animal suffering, we need to develop models that predict the effects of interventions on biodiversity, ecosystem functioning, as well as animal well-being. So, <coughs> so we'll focus our critique on two specific proposals for interventions to prevent wild animal suffering. So we're going to talk about um, gene editing aimed at changing the reproductive behavior of prey species. Uh, this was recently proposed by Kyle Johansson uh, in an article in Ethical Theory and Moral Practice. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss reprogram, reprogramming predator species, again through genetic intervention, um, to be herbivores, to cease engaging in predatory behavior. So we've chosen these interventions because the proponents of these interventions claim that they do not require continuous widespread human interference in the natural world. Um, the thought is, you drive, you put a gene in, you drive it through the population, you stand back and watch. Right? You're not constantly tinkering, tinkering with ecosystems. Um, and we think that these 
interventions, um, and here we might be mistaken, but we take them to be representative of the kind of intervention that any large-scale attempt to reduce wild animal suffering would entail or require. Um, so demonstrating the epistemic difficulties associated with these specific interventions, uh, we take um, to be illuminating of the general epistemic problem facing interventions to prevent wild animal suffering. Okay, so, um, kind of a silly chart, but uh, gets the idea across. So, so Kyle Johansson recent, has recently addressed wild animal suffering caused by the re reproductive behavior of our strategists. Um, and Oscar discussed this in quite a bit of detail yesterday. Um, so these are species of animals. Um, so this is the, uh, the life trajectory of um, our strategists, members of our strategist species. These are case strategists. Um, so uh, our strategists are species of animals that ensure survival of subsequent generations by producing a large quantity of offspring <coughs> who die before they reach sexual maturity. Um, the R strategy is used by many smaller vertebrates to ensure survival through quantity. So offspring do not receive the same careful attention characteristic of larger mammal species who reproduce using the K strategy. As a result, many R strategist offspring die prematurely. And in Johansson's words, the amount of suffering and premature death associated with the R strategy <coughs> is enormous. So as an example of the suffering associated with the R strategy, Johansson describes a population study of the wall lizard, um, in which of the 194 reptiles that survived birth for one year, only 48 reached sexual maturity. And Johansson conjectures that the vast majority of the lizards who faced their demise before the age of two suffered both abysmal fates. And we agree. Um, that this may have been the case for many of them. Um, and uh, perhaps even more illustrative of the problems with the R strategy is the cod example discussed yesterday, where you have as many as is it 300 million eggs? No? Um, no. Okay. Um, so, how then should someone concerned with wild animal suffering respond? So Johansson argues that the emerging gene editing technology called clustered, regularly, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, commonly known as CRISPR, I will be calling it for the rest of the talk, holds promise to alter wild animals' reproductive behavior to prevent the massive and painful loss of life suffered by animals like the common wall lizard. So CRISPR can be used um, to spread nearly any type of genome alteration through sexually reproducing populations in as few as 10 generations, um, scientists, some scientists project. Um, so Johansson hopes that we can use so-called gene drives to drive traits that reduce reproductive viability through our strategist populations to reduce their fertility rates. If successful, this would reduce the number of offspring that suffer abysmal fates thereby reducing, wild, reducing suffering in the wild. Of course, as Johansson acknowledges, this solution only begins with reducing the fertility of prey species. One must then confront the risk of extinction posed to our strategists <coughs> by the reduction in fertility, given the fact of predation, disease, and um, climatic shifts. And relatedly, one must then worry about the effect of reducing the prey population on predator species who rely on them for survival. Um, so, this leads to a complementary intervention suggest, that's been suggested by Jeff McMahon <coughs> and developed in greater detail by David Pierce. So, Pierce suggests that we could genetically reprogram uh, carnivores, again, through using CRISPR gene drives to suppress their inherited predatory traits while preserving all the other traits required for them to flourish. The, quote, hyper-nurturing behavior, <coughs> unquote, of eusocial animals could be harnessed in carnivores to protect members of species they currently predate. Their diet, the thought is, could be replaced by a supply of, perhaps, cultured meat 
Um, or perhaps we can modify them even further to subsist on plants. Um, so in just a little bit about the uh, limitations of CRISPR. So in 2014, a group of experts drew attention to the promise of CRISPR um, for interventions in ecosystems, but also to some of its limitations. So first, it works only through sexual reproduction. So it does not affect asexually reprodu reproducing species. Um, this includes viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, uh, and some plants. Um, Second, there is no way to ensure the continued prevalence of the desired trait in the face of natural selection. Um, so the thought is natural selection might select against our new introduced trait, so we might have to continuously drive it through the population right, to make it stick. And third, because it operates via sexual reproduction, a significant reduction in wild animal suffering could not be achieved um, for several generations by reprogramming predators since the beneficial trait would need many generations to spread throughout the population. And this could take uh, decades or centuries for long-lived, very long-lived organisms. Um, but setting these limitations aside, the technology seems promising on its face. Um, okay, so we now want to turn to the central concern of our paper, um, which is the epistemic hurdles facing interventions to reduce suffering in the wild um, in the two ways we just mentioned, right? changing reproductive behavior and reprogramming predators. So this section argues that such interventions, when scaled up to meet the actual demands of wild animal suffering, are epistemically fraught because of the unpredictability of their interactions with social, social ecological systems. Um, so our argument yields the conclusion that the problem of wild animal suffering is intractable, to use a popular term in the effective altruist community. A cause is tractable if additional resources can be expected to do a great deal of good to address the problem. Um, we grant that solving the problem of wild animal suffering would have a great impact. And we grant that there are few people working to address the problem at present. So it is a neglected problem. Um, but if our epistemic argument is sound, the problem of wild animal suffering is deeply intractable, so we cannot expect, we cannot therefore expect additional resources to do a great deal of good to address the problem. Um, so we begin with, in some ways, <coughs> perhaps a little bit of a cheap inductive argument against interventions. Um, it goes like this, we've done a poor job anticipating and controlling the effects of large-scale interventions into ecological systems in the past. Uh, so consider, for example, the development and implementation of industrial ag in the 20th century. High intensity, high yield methods of industrial agriculture have caused diminished topsoil, reduced freshwater availability, it caused aquatic dead zones, biodiversity losses, and large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, industrial agriculture has produced enormous externalized costs, both ecological and social. Um, so, this came up in Antoine's talk a little bit yesterday, um, but ecologists have recently come to endorse uh, what, you can, what you might call um, resilience thinking about um, ecological conservation. So on this approach, ecosystems have alternative regimes um, that are separated. So regime is a, called the cup and ball, cup and ball heuristic. Um, so this is one regime, represented by this cup, right? Um, you've got the threshold here. Um, so these regimes are separated by thresholds. So ecological systems on this view are more complex and less stable than uh, outdated equilibrium and succession theory assume. Hence, they're harder to predict in some ways. Um, so ecosystems continually undergo adaptive cycles from rapid growth and conservation to release and reorganization and their variables interact at different temporal and spatial scales. Ecosystems on this <coughs> are constantly fluctuating entities, which, um, given their, quote, path dependence, unquote, makes them somewhat unpredictable. A process is path dependent if, at any given time, it admits of multiple possible outcomes, and the probability of outcomes changes as a function of the order of events in the system. 
So in this picture, ecological systems have multiple possible regimes, or um, we can call them also dynamic equilibria, um, or basin of attraction, is the term used, um, into which they might fall. And it's possible for them to shift <coughs> um, from one regime to another. <coughs> Some of these regimes will be um, degraded states. They will be states with less integrity. Um, and because thresholds exist between these regimes, an ecosystem might fall into a degraded state and become locked in there or stuck there. Um, and a key point here is that uh, the new state, the new regime state that it becomes locked into, this degraded state, um, will involve highly variable amounts of net suffering. Um, it's extremely difficult to identify ex ante um, what the sort of, um, what the balance is likely to be in a, uh, in a new, in an ecosystem that finds itself in a new degraded regime. So this new approach to ecological modeling and management does away with the old framework of uh, equilibrium and stability, and it replaces it with the notion of resilience, which is understood as the amount of disturbance or external change an ecosystem can absorb while remaining within the same regime, as well as the speed with which it recovers from disturbance. So resilience thinking involves managing unpredictability by promoting resilience in order to avoid, insofar as it is possible, an abrupt shift from one regime to a degraded state. Um, so ecosystem resilience is a function of structural and response diversity, functional redundancy, modularity, and spatial heterogeneity. So these factors that are relevant to resilience might be negatively impacted by interventions to wild animal suffering, to prevent wild animal suffering. So the thought here is that simplified ecosystems in which trophic chains are shortened, habitats are altered, or homogenized and diversity is decreased um, can, um, can reduce resilience, increasing uh, the likelihood of falling into a degraded state. So to see, to illustrate the effect that interventions might have on resilience at the population level, resilience of a species population, um, consider Johansson's proposal to change the reproductive behavior of our strategists. So there's no question that uh, such an intervention would reduce functional redundancy, which requires different animals living in the same ecosystem that perform the same ecosystem functions. Right. Um, so, I don't actually know how many offspring a red squirrel has, but suppose it's an R strategist. Right. Um, right. Uh, it is, in this system, um, I like this notion here better. It's, pr it's playing um, a role as a uh, primary consumer. Okay. That's one of its ecological functions. Um, so, our selected species rely, so the thought here is that by removing the snowshoe hare from the population, you reduce functional redundancy by reducing the um, number of species in the, in, the, in the ecosystem that perform the function of primary consumption. And this, uh, the concern is, will reduce resilience in the ecosystem. Um, okay. So our selected species rely on having a vast number of offspring to retain their population numbers. Case strategists rely on the quality of individuals or their capacity to respond to stress and variations. Um, uh, in general, however, the general point is that our strategists have a lot greater flexibility at the population level, making them more resilient to major disruptions, even if only at the expense of very many individuals. Um, so our strategists are more resilient than case strategists to changes in population dynamics and other major environmental changes. So the concern is that changing the reproductive behavior of our strategists um, to resemble that of case strategists thus risks extinction of the modified species in the face of predation and environmental change. Um, 
thereby reducing functional redundancy. One worry, which Johansson uh, acknowledges, is that too many of the prey species young will be predated, and the species will be driven to extinction. I brought this up already. A related worry is that reduced numbers of prey will cause predator species to starve, driving them to the brink of extinction as well. And even if prey species are not driven to extinction, their numbers may dwindle to the point at which they no longer perform their function as a primary consumer, reducing functional redundancy in the interests. So Johansson's solution to concerns about extinction is to develop plant species that predators can eat in lieu of prey. He says, though we won't know for sure until the necessary research is conducted, CRISPR's success with editing plant genes gives us reason to believe that it's possible to develop plants that are suitable for carnivores. Why not? It's a young technology. Its, it's potential applications are, uh, as of yet, underexplored. Maybe it'll work. This, in essence, is the converse of Pierce's proposal to reprogram predators to eat plants. So, reprogram plants to be eaten by predators. Um, but it's not enough to save prey that we provide predators with the opportunity to eat a plant-based diet. Um, they must also be programmed to be disposed to do so. But they must also be programmed not to needlessly engage in hunting behavior. So anyone who lives with domestic cats, this is not a scientific, this is not a, based on any science, it's based on my experience with my own cat. Um, anyone who lives with domestic cats knows that hunger is not a necessary condition for predatory behavior. Um, it seems to arise out of some sort of innate evil. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of sadism. Um, moreover, predation is but one threat to the survival of prey species. Right? Predation is only one threat. Um, disease, environmental change, and habitat loss are equally threatening. And a greater reproductive capacity increases our strategist species resilience against these threats as well. And it's unclear how providing carnivores with a plant-based diet alleviates the heightened threat posed to former bar strategists by disease or habitat loss. It's even possible that introducing a plant-based diet for carnivores will threaten prey species more than predation by putting former prey species in competition with former predator species for the same resources. Introduced plants the thought here is that introduced plants might compete for resources with native plants on which former R strategists feed, and these non-native plants may become invasive, reducing the food available for former prey species. So um, that's a little bit about um, the effect of interventions on <coughs> um, prey species and functional redundancy. But Interventions to prevent wild animal suffering can reduce resilience of the whole ecosystem um, uh, at the level of the predator as well. Um, and this is an even, I think, easier case to make. Um, so as mentioned above, right, the resilient ecosystem requires um, functional redundancy, which again is the presence of multiple species serving the same ecological function. Having multiple predator species to control prey populations it's not a great example, but um, uh, given the diagram, but um, having multiple predator species to control prey populations is one example of functional redundancy. Um, without functional redundancy, there is no buffer against the downstream effects of the depletion or loss of one species. Um, an ecosystem with less functional redundancy is less resilient and more likely to go regime change. But genetically altering the um, eating behavior of predator species necessarily reduces functional redundancy by removing one channel through which the species trophic function can be realized. Um, so Naeem et al. Um, nicely captured just how complex these functional interactions might be. Um, so here's a long block quote, forgive me. Um, Each species possesses functional traits which reflect their tolerances and responses to and impacts on environmental factors such as soil, soil moisture, salinity, and nutrient availability. The species will be related to one another by their functional traits, ranging from being nearly redundant, i.e. having the same set of functional traits in common, 
or nearly singular. So there's a lot of redundancy here. There's very little redundancy here. Third, species also possess homologous characters that reflect their shared evolutionary history or phylogeny and will be either closely or distantly related. Collectively, these many factors determine the biodiversity <coughs> of the community, all of them influencing flows of energy into and out of the inorganic pool, the use and return of water, and the flow of energy sequestered by primary producers and lost through respiration. So altering reproductive or predatory, predatory traits of species that occupies, of a species that occupies a high trophic level, um, so an apex predator, or that plays a keystone function, um, can lead to radical downstream changes that reverberate through an ecosystem. Um, and we've seen this uh, with the loss and reintroduction of the Yellowstone wolf. You had <coughs> the presence of a single predator, um, and Greg did a nice job of explaining the downstream effects, the large scale downstream effects of the reintroduction of the wolf. Um, um, you, have, you have a case where removing one important apex predator had massive ecological ramifications. So here's the crucial point. An ecosystem's regime state significantly determines the well-being of the organisms that constitute it. A species' functional traits can affect ecosystem functioning in myriad ways that we've discussed. Uh, primary productivity, nutrient cycling, decomposition, susceptibility to invasion, the spread of disease, or the stability of its populations. Insofar as an ecosystem's regime, regime, regime state significantly determines the well-being of the organisms that constitute it, um, answering the question of which genetic alterations, when driven through a population, will reduce rather than amplify suffering is a deeply complicated matter from an ecological point of view. Um, that's what we've tried to illustrate. Um, so, the effects of interventions to prevent suffering on resilience are compounded by uncertainty surrounding the effects of climate change. Um, the challenge posed by climate change to the efficacy of interventions to prevent suffering is similar to the challenge posed by climate change to conservation biology. And this was discussed a little bit in Claire's talk earlier in the week. So conservation biologists aim to preserve species uh, in situ, um, that is, in their native habitats. Right? They don't want to just preserve them anywhere, they want to preserve them where they are naturally found. And they do this primarily through place-based preservation strategies. So for example, one might designate as a protected wilderness area the native habitat of an endangered species. Um, but climate change, um, like the uh, Western American pika, um, but climate change calls into question the effectiveness of place-based preservation. Right? The trouble is that place-based efforts are incapable of addressing the global changes that are wrought by climate change. For example, coral reef bleaching cannot be halted by protecting their habitat as a marine sanctuary. This is because the causes of coral reef bleaching are ocean acidification and elevated greenhouse gas emissions, um, the origins of which are global rather than local. So proposed interventions to prevent wild animal suffering are, we suggest, also inherently place-based strategies. So they aim to affect the target species in situ, changing interactions between individuals and their habitat. At least, that's what the interventions we consider here appear to be. They try to change the dynamic between our strategist species um, and their surrounding habitat, including uh, their predators. So they face a similar challenge. So the thought here is that it's impossible to predict with any sort of precision what the effects of climate change will be on a given ecosystem regime, in part because there are several possible and significantly divergent scenarios associated with climate change. Which scenario is realized will be determined by the extent of surface air temperature rise, what a warmer world with higher greenhouse gas concentrations and more acidic oceans will mean for ecosystem integrity and resilience, which mitigation and or adaptation strategies are effectively adopted by human societies, and finally, how human societies respond to different climate change outcomes. So the crucial issue here is the social, the social factor. Um, 
So the, the future concentration of greenhouse gas emissions depends on how many emissions occur, which in turn depends on future human decision making and its impact on economic developments, policy making, and technological innovation. Uh, but, and this point is crucial, the way human societies will use technologies, we suggest, is impossible to predict ex ante. So Dale Jameson's remarks about the unpredictable nature of technology are apropos here. So um, another uh, long block quote, apologies again. When it comes to performing the benefit-cost calculation concerning many technological innovations, we're ignorant rather than uncertain. Not only can we not do the sums, but we don't know with any precision what sorts of things we would have to know in order to do them. While scientific information would be important to performing the cost-benefit calculation, it is information about the actual human use and social development of the technologies in question that matters most. The benefit-cost calculation for technological innovation depends on who will control them, who has access to them, how they will impact on the global maldistribution of wealth, how they will affect human health, how they will affect human welfare, and other consequences. So for any particular technological innovation, we are quite ignorant about most of this. In part because the actual benefits and costs of the innovation will depend on decisions that people make subsequent to the initial decision to deploy the technology. What humans do, will do in the future, is not just unknown, it's indeterminate. Uh, close quote. So given the political, social, and economic upheaval um, of the last several years. It's safe to say that I think we have very little idea of what climate change scenario to expect in 2100, and even less of an idea of what the human resp response will be. The one thing that we can be clear about is that whatever emission scenario we envision, we can expect more and more rapid ecological variability than we have seen in recent history. The upshot for wild animal suffering is that any technological intervention to prevent suffering must grapple with the possibility that the ecosystems of the species they are targeting will be radically and unpredictably different 20, 50, or 100 years from now. Okay. So the thought here is that this exacerbates concerns raised earlier about Johansson's proposal to reduce the number of offspring of our strategists. For populations of species whose numbers have few offspring and longer gestation periods, are less likely to be able to adapt to ecosystem changes than populations whose numbers rapidly reproduce large numbers of offspring. Given relatively stable conditions, perhaps we can anticipate and respond to these changes in advance, but climate change calls this feasibility, the feasibility of such responses into question. Okay, so, um, So we've argued that the complexity and unpredictability of ecosystems and the indeterminacy associated, sorry, I'm checking the time, associated with climate change and the human response to it entail that interventions to prevent wild animal suffering are, for all we know, as likely to exacerbate the problem as they are to ameliorate it. And so in this section we discuss the normative implications of this, basically, of this uh, fundamentally epistemic argument. One normative implication is already clear. With respect to the prevention of suffering, there is presently no reason to favor large-scale interventions. Um, and uh, given um, the great deal of uncertainty about the future, it's unclear when we could foresee to uh, have sufficient reason to think that interventions would be successful. But there are other reasons for concern um, about interventions that we think tip the balance against intervening. So first, um, interventions, uh, successful or not, will cause harm. So whatever institution or individual, uh, or individual administers the intervention is therefore responsible for doing harm. On the other, on the other hand, harm that is caused by non-intervention is harm that the agent merely allows. So, Tatiana has uh, um, objected to this point in the past, fairly so. Um, so she said, you can't just raise the doing allowing distinction and not spend any time justifying it. Um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna do much in the way of justifying it here either, so I apologize. But, um, so we're not going to defend the moral significance of the distinction, 
that would be a much bigger project. But we merely want to point out that the doing allowing distinction is important, it's commonly thought, for maintaining a space of permissible options for moral agents. Um, without the distinction between doing and allowing, uh, morality begins to look um, quite a bit uh, demanding. Because you're as morally responsible for the harm that you allow as the harm that you do. And as it turns out, individual human beings allow a lot of harm, a great deal of harm. Um, so we merely point out, though, that the doing allowing distinction is important for maintaining, maintaining these, these options. And it's also supposed to be <coughs> sense objections to consequentialist moral theories, including things like harvesting a healthy person's organs to save the lives of five other patients. And that's the one example of among many. Um, so if doing harm is more than worse than allowing harm, the harm that we do by intervening is more than worse than the harm that we merely allow by not intervening. On most formulations of the doing allowing distinction, this means that interventions to prevent suffering would be morally justified only if they prevented a great deal more harm than they caused. Because um, right? the thought here is, it's not sufficient to justify killing one that you save the lives of five. The number's gotta be a lot larger than five. Right? What that number is, I don't, I don't want to speculate about. So, um, you know, but after all, there is some number of lives n such that we would be permitted to kill one to save n lives. But for the aforementioned reasons, the aforementioned epistemic concerns, this is not the position that we are in with respect to interventions for prevent violent animal suffering. And note that this objection does not apply to calls to refrain from reintroducing predator species to areas where they've been driven to extinction. Um, reintroducing such species would also count as doing harm. Um, so furthermore, uh, we know with some degree of certainty that interventions to prevent wild animal suffering will directly threaten non-welfare values that some people take very seriously. Uh, for example, as Ned uh, described in helpful detail yesterday, some, inter uh, some environmentalists hold that wild nature has significant value and that such value is necessarily undermined by human interference with or influence on that system. So using CRISPR, to directly change the genomic composition of an entire population of organisms would presumably count as human interference that undermines their natural value, if anything would. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear what Ned's take on that would be. Um, but interventions to prevent wild animal suffering also require intellectual and material resources. Um, advocacy groups fundraising for such interventions would likely divert away money from other causes that may be more attractive. For instance, issues like the abolition or reform of factory farming. Uh, and this is why the Meta Charity Animal Charity Evaluators does not yet recommend prioritizing donations toward wild animal suffering, even though they do recognize the importance of the problem. Okay, so we're going to consider um, how am I doing on time? Three minutes? Okay, great. So we'll consider uh, a handful of objections. So Tyler Cohen, um, this is all on the board here, um, and uh, uh, Oscar discussed some of these yesterday as well. So, but Tyler Cohen makes the following replies to the sort of epistemic argument we've offered. First, we are already intervening in nature all the time without knowledge of our effects. Um, so interventions to prevent wild animal suffering don't add to that uncertainty and so should be considered on their own merits. Our argument simply implies uncertainty about all policies, including non-intervention. So in reply to this objection, I, we admit um, that against the backdrop of global climate change, maybe interventions are just noise and hence do not exacerbate uncertainty or unpredictability. But certain types of interventions will generate, um, will decrease resilience uh, and undermine ecosystem functions that preserve the integrity of an ecosystem in the face of climate change, right? functional redundancy. Um, moreover, that we are presently intervening in nature with great ignorance of and indifference to the effects of our intervention does not imply that we're justified in doing so to a greater extent. Um, second, small-scale interventions are unlikely to lead to ecological disaster. Can we do those? Uh, in short, yes. Um, so small-scale interventions are not our concern. So freeing a particular deer caught in a particular fence is unlikely to lead to cascading 
ecosystem effects and abrupt unexpected regime change. Right? So the kinds of examples that uh, Oscar went through in great detail uh, yesterday, um, I think would be unproblematic on our argument. Um, and then a third objection, eliminating the European wolf was clearly a good thing from the perspective of suffering and did not lead to ecological disaster. There was no impending ecological problem when wolves were reintroduced, were reintroduced to Yellowstone. I'm not sure exactly what to say in light of Greg's talk uh, yesterday. Um, this seems highly contentious, in fact. Um, as Greg pointed out yesterday, and we saw that the reintroduction of the Yellowstone wolf arguably had a number of benefits with respect to promoting animal well-being. Perhaps on balance, it was beneficial. Um, and so that it is highly contentious is further support for our concern that welfare-based defensive interventions to prevent wild animal suffering is tenuous. Um, so in sum, we do not disagree that we may have reason to believe that many small-scale interventions can be justified. However, the intervention we have considered could have large-scale consequences. From the perspective of ecosystem resilience, our activities can make a difference when they systematically disrupt the capacity of ecosystems to adapt to perturbations. Um, okay. So, a possible way forward, and here, I think, Oscar and we are in complete agreement, is to take a cue from adaptive management and test interventions on a piecemeal basis, gradually adjusting their design and implementation in response to the resulting ecological changes or lack thereof. Indeed, this is how conservationists and res uh, restoration ecologists deal with uncertainty. So we have to employ a flexible learning process whereby hypotheses, models, and policies are continuously adjusted in response to experimental interventions. Now we can now break our, our view down into uh, two theses. The negative thesis is that we're not justified in thinking that existing large-scale proposals to intervene to prevent wild animal suffering would in fact reduce total suffering. We are in no position to know. Um, our positive thesis is that for interventions to be justified, we need to first develop metrics and models that predict, predict the effects of ecosystem of interventions or any human activity for that matter on biodiversity, ecosystem functioning, as well as animals' well-being. Interestingly, uh, Yu Kang In, one early proponent of welfare-sensitive biological science, has recently suggested that we should focus on the suffering of domesticated species before dedicating significant resources to wild animal suffering. This positive thesis, um, however, is also limit limited epistemically. The partial indeterminacy of social ecological systems that we discussed uh, and the extreme complexity of the ecological processes captured by existing models make the, the cascading effects of large-scale intervention extremely hard to predict. And the problem is compounded by the rate, magnitude, and uncertainty associated with global environmental change. Thanks. That's it. Thank you, Damien. We only have 15 minutes for the discussion, so we'll have to... Go quick. Quick, quick, uh, and question, quick answer. Maybe you can turn to... Turn them around, yeah, yeah, so you can see the, all the... Yeah. Angry faces. Okay, so Jeff can start and then keep your hand up. Okay. You may have to read the questions for me. I'm not sure about Okay, we'll find out. Okay. Okay. So, so I want to ask about you're doing a line of distinction, but maybe I can wait for my talks and tell <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, maybe, uh, yeah. so, so instead, uh, uh, briefly, hmm. I completely agree with you that we should be very epistemically humble and cautious and we should do as much research as necessary. And so I think you are in alignment with Oscar there. Right. And, and I, I agree with both of you. Um, I do worry a little bit about the the way forward that you you suggested okay. as you suggested because yeah. I worry a little bit that this is such a complicated issue mm -hmm. that it might be difficult, if not impossible, to marshal the kind of evidence we might prefer to have <clears throat> in support of or against various types of interventions. Mm -hmm. And so if we think that we need to have that kind of evidence in order to justify an intervention, that could lead to a problematic kind of measurability bias or status quo bias. And so it could lead us to default to non-intervention, mm -hmm. even if, in fact, intervention could end up being quite a good course of action. So I just yeah. wonder, I agree with your yeah. humility and caution, but, yeah. but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, whether you feel concerned about risk of measurability bias or status quo bias there. Great. Nicola, did you hear that? Yeah. Great. Um, so 
what I would say is if we're if we're going to be justified in large scale interventions to prevent suffering in the wild, then we do need extremely good evidence that they would be successful for the reason we just read. Um, it may be that, like you said, it is impossible to get the kind of evidence we would need to be epistemically and hence um, morally justified from a subjective point of view in deploying those interventions. This might lead to an extremely unfortunate scenario where a particular intervention would objectively, as it turns out, prevent a great deal of suffering, but we wouldn't be justified in thinking that it would. So there might just be, that might be the position that we end up in with respect to something like this. Now, is the problem, I don't know if the proper response in that case is just to say, well, screw the evidence then, <laughs> right? Or let's lower the threshold for justification, right? Maybe um, something more like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The more charitable reading. Um, yeah, uh, and then there is a, um, and then there is this question about how to do the cost-benefit analysis um, when some alternative outcomes are much much worse than the status quo, yeah. and others are are significantly better. And I don't have a great answer. I think it's a hard question. Maybe Nikola does. No, I think it's a great answer. Uh, yeah. Um, so the concern is that we're raising the bar too high for the new standards for intervention? Yeah, sure. And you're, okay, so you're proposing this would lower the standard? Maybe. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, in like lower risk situation, I would be happy to do that. I think we've made the case that the situation is not a low risk one, but they are quite high risk of potential disasters and catastrophes in different perspective of animal welfare. So if we're correct about this, I think that we're, uh, it's, it's, it's worth raising the bar a little bit. Uh, but for small scale interventions, certainly I think we can lower the threshold. And that's why the, the way forward is about, I think there's a compromise between uh, raising the bar too high for any intervention to be ever warranted and, and lowering the bar so low that uh, any type of intervention to remove that huge problem would be warranted. So that's the sort of battles we're trying to strike, I think. Oh, I'll go And uh, Yeah, it's just a quick clarification yeah. question, which uh, you can show us a bit what, what Jeff said. So I just was wondering about whether there are really strong differences between what you argue for and what Oscar yeah. Hart argues for. Because in the very end of his talk, he said, well, we should consider that. And I think, well, I don't want to talk of Oscar, but I have the impression that he says, well, we should do more science, and what, what you seem to be doing, it, it's less so a philosophical point, I would say, it's more mm -hmm. a technical and really empirical point, mm -hmm. and I think if, if yeah. it would be disastrous consequences, then I think uh, uh, anti-species as utilitarians would buy into your conclusion. So I just wonder whether you yeah. see the, the difference. Yeah, so I think this is large, well, do you want to take that? Uh, can you just summarize it very quickly? Uh, our argument is primarily technical, and we're not raising philosophical objections to an argument like Oscar's. Okay. Um, so, what, to what extent? You didn't see his talk, but it, she's asking to what extent we, we agree with, with each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so um, I think we do largely agree. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, but there is this further question about given um, given the intractability of wild animal suffering at present, how much reason do we have to believe that future resources devoted to, say, research into wild animal suffering would be fruitful? And this is a further question that we don't really talk about, but um, but I think it's an important one, right? There's this meta question, right? Um, what's the value of future research that needs to be addressed? Um, and um, especially when we have at hand some really clear methods for reducing overall suffering, um, say abolishing wood forming and factory farming. Um, uh, and then as far as the philosophical point, I think the, the most, I think the philosophical point we make here is that we have a kind of moral asymmetry with respect to our epistemic position regarding suffering and our epistemic position with respect to competing values like naturalness, um, wild autonomy, and so on. Um, because I don't think there's any question that driving CRISPR or driving genes through a uh, population um, would certainly reduce 
the natural value, um, if natural value is genuine value. Um, and the harm that we cause would be harm that we do, not harm that we allow. allowed. There's no question about that, or so we argue. Mode? Uh, thank you, Lois. Great talk, it was super clear, and I'm really happy you addressed this question, uh, the investing and concern. Great. And so I have kind of a clarification question. I'm new to that literature. Uh, as first talked yesterday, your talk today, and everything. And um, I think I'm becoming a bit puzzled by what exactly, in the end, guys mean by suffering, because. Um, <coughs> It seems that this could lead us very far if we're going to accept that, uh, like we, we like we <coughs> can seem to take on to reduce or prevent suffering in, in wildlife. You, you yourself call the problem intractable. So that just kind of says how difficult it is. And um, isn't there a sense that there's some type of like in factory farming? We all agree the suffering is undesirable because we cause it, right? It's, it's, that's easy. Right. And then we, we get into that type of suffering, which we could call somewhat natural, but like, you know, sure. you know we're just going off. <laughs> so where does it lead us, like, say, with human suffering, like, our love relationships make us suffer, um, we, we're, we're like, we're anxious beings, like, our life is, like, entails a lot of suffering. Are we just going to take pills? And that you all the time, this very could be. Like we have the means to do that. Right. We have the means to suffer a lot less. We're just gonna numb ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so where does where does that question stand and how come it doesn't lead us to that? Which would seem, I guess, and the concern is this would be seem to be an undesirable human life. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh Nicole? Yeah. That means a few words, but I think I get the gist of it. Um, you want to address that one? So let me just uh, rephrase to, to make sure I understood it. So the question, so it's a question that we are causing animal suffering in fact reforming, but we're not causing animal suffering in the wild, but then we wouldn't accept not assisting human beings in the wild if, and even if that suffering was not caused by us. Is that a concern? Well, I'm I think sure. it's a little different than that. I, I think the idea is that there are some respects in which a human life is more desirable if it involves certain types of suffering. And oh. is it an implication of this type of argument that eliminating, that we ought to just eliminate all suffering? All suffering is bad if all detracts from the value of a life. And okay. Because yeah. you imagine a life with no suffering, it kind of it's, I don't know, not necessarily great. Yeah, sure. So, well, that's a philosophical question. Um, so, I think, so in the introduction, we, we grant that uh, suffering is intrinsically bad. We also grant that in some cases, uh, all things considered, we had reason to promote suffering, including human lives, for a greater good. I don't think uh, many human beings, if any, would value suffering intrinsically, regardless of the other goods that it may. Uh, help us achieve. Um, that being said, I'm quite sympathetic to the view that a human life filled with a reasonable amount of suffering might be more interesting, maybe more desirable, maybe more, maybe more worth living than a, a, a life with less suffering. It might have to do with some special cognitive capacities of human beings, and that might not be true of other animals. So that's one way which we might make the distinction. Um, so that's serious concern, uh, but for the purposes of framing the paper, we are granting a major premise of the reduction of one animal suffering provenance, namely that suffering is bad enough that we should we do have strong moral reasons to try to prevent it. So within that frame, that's the argument proposing, and I think the paper would be quite different if we were uh, trying to balance the potential values of of suffering, uh, but but that being said, that that might be among the reasons we might add uh, in the in the later part of the paper uh, for uh, for motivating or reasons which being uh, in comparison with other values, so naturalness, wildness, maybe the aesthetic value of biodiversity of species. Maybe we should also include 
the fact that suffering does have some important value for human beings. And so in the context of how human agents will respond to such interventions, that might be something to take into account. Yeah, I think that's, that might be helpful later in the paper. Yeah. I want to add to that. Am I allowed to? Uh, yeah, we just, it's just that we have, we no have time. Like two minutes for three more questions. Okay, but, um, we'll talk about it. I want to say something about it too. Uh, maybe we can do it all together. Claire, uh, Baird, and Greg. So um, I guess my question is partly that I'm completely skeptical about the science that you're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's kind of an experiment and, and thought, you know, a thought experiment. Um, but the idea that you could use CRISPR to make a line as oh. a non predator to or stay, for instance. I mean, it's not just a matter of changing its urges to chase things. You've got its digestive system, its teeth, oh, yeah. its feet, you know. It's, and then at the end, you'd have to think, well, do we still have lines at all? Now, that's not an issue you need to worry about if you were only concerned about suffering and other things. And other things. But it does seem like a, a kind of a, a bizarre proposal, both in scientific terms and in terms of what that would mean and what you had when you finished with it, as it were. Yeah. Uh, just oh, yeah, okay, great. Question uh, the, rapid fire. Short question, please. I think it's interesting that you brought up the uh, biomedical principle of uh, do no harm. Uh, what about the current biomedical principle of do not patronize? And uh, what, uh, by what authority uh, do we have to intervene on the head? animals without consulting them mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, to see if that's what they really want. Right. Good. Right. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to add a uh, detail to your R versus K selection diagram. You oh, add? yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> that I think lends support to your very careful, cautious, and, and illuminating argument, which I really appreciate it. No, the, uh, the R versus K selection one. Oh, yeah. But, but for me, who uh, tends to go beyond the uh, careful cautious argument you're um, suggesting, I think what I'm about to say also lends support to the idea that nature is a lot better at promoting animal welfare than humans are or ever could be. But of course, that's going a lot further. But at least what I'm about to say lends support to your argument. And that is um, that. Uh, the, the neurological hardware that's required to um, produce suffering, pain, and pleasure is actually quite expensive. And so if you're an R-selected species and you're creating a gazillion offspring, you're not going to invest much in that kind of neurological hardware. So the R-selected species are less sentient and therefore less prone to suffer than the, than the K-selected species. So at least conceivably, it could be that there's no difference in the net amount of suffering done by K versus R selected species because you have this negative uh, correlation well, between sentience and uh, number of offspring. Well, I have no idea. I will take your word on that, but that would be great for our argument. Oscar will disagree. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, have to uh, shake this head vigorously. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not that vigorously. So I have lots of a whole lot of things I'd like to say, but yeah, we have no time, so I'll try to rush. So, um, yeah, well, first, just a, a brief note. I think that when you are a, in a state of real hard, badly needing help, you really uh, uh, would like to be uh, uh, helped, even if you can't express this, this, uh, uh, this need. Uh, and also, as, as we talked uh, about this uh, yesterday, you can see how very, very, diff very, very similar animals. Some of them have huge uh, numbers of offspring, where others have uh, very few. Such as, for instance, amongst beetles, you have dung beetles just lay a very few number of eggs. Other beetles lay much more, many more eggs. Plausible, it's, it's not impossible to think that ones are far more sentient than others. So that's why I think your concern uh, doesn't apply. And just let me make one, one comment regarding this with R and K structure. So this was, uh, this, the use of this term is something that, uh, yeah, I'm guilty of it because it's been generalized a bit, but it's kind of uh, misleading because, uh, you know, RK theory is a view that has been hardly criticized since, since the 80s, and the use of this terminology may seem to suggest some, some support for, for, for this theory, so I think uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't use it. Uh, 
from for when we are touching this. And yeah, I'm the one who's trying to use it, so I'm using this. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> if you stop, we'll stop. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and then uh, just a couple of more things. So I agree with the thing with the status quo, uh, status quo bias, and I think that we should definitely do lots of research, but not because we have to compare, we don't have to compare two situations, the current one and the one after intervention, and try to see which one is better. That's not the relevant comparison. The relevant comparison is that between us, uh, the scenario that occurs after we intervene in a certain way and the scenario that occurs after we intervene in another way. Because uh, we can't assume that the, that the present situation is a good one. And then, uh, um, well, just uh, a couple of things. Uh, I, I was very interested in, 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 in what you had to say. But then, you know, many of the things you mentioned uh, uh, aren't really uh, uncontroversial. I mean, I agree with them regarding uh, the, the the impact uh, intervention may have, and I think Kyle and Dave uh, would agree too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that that's not the key question. The key question you addressed it very very fast, which is yeah, and it's a deeply com complicated matter uh, from an ecological point of view uh, whether this will result in more suffering or not. But that is a question, yeah. not the impact of the matter. We know about that already, but the research we want to do is. When we have that impact, will that entail more suffering and more disability for animals or not? So that, that is the actual uh, question uh, we need to do. And also, because of this, concerning habitat loss, you need to introduce population ethics there. Because, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe maybe habitat loss is not that bad after all. And then just, sorry, I, I know I, I, I spoke a lot, sorry. But just the last question or the last point, regarding uh, this thing that you mentioned concerning intractability, I don't think anything is intractable. Everything absolutely is tractable with enough time, and the problem is that we have to prioritize. <coughs> and the thing with animal charity, while we when I happen to be an animal ethics uh, organization, as, as Leah is, and well, all the people here sympathize with the group, and actually it's being considered a standout organization by animal charity, while which means that, you know, the tide is, is changing. So it seems that uh, within the uh, yeah, animal act activism, the concern is now to see how we are going to support this, this cause, rather than whether the cause really is the worst portion or not. Mm. So that's it. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm guilty of talking too much. Sorry. Do you have a minute to answer to all this? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um. Baird was first. Uh, I agree. I think there's. Oh, I thought. Doesn't matter. Oh, then I know Chris. Okay. Uh, Claire went first. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, so you might say, look, um, if so, we suggest that this is representative of the way. If you're if you're interested in intervening in wild animal suffering on a large on a large scale, right, to sort of make a significant dent. Um, we take it this is the kind, this is representative of the kind of thing you would do. The fact that it seems so scientifically dubious and unpromising might be an indication that large scale intervention, insofar as this is representative of what it would look like, would be scientifically dubious and unpromising. Um, uh, but again, it doesn't speak to small scale, small scale scientific intervention. Um, interesting point about sentience. Uh, yeah, I, I will. We should talk about that more. Um, it sounds like it's controversial. Um, the song, uh, Baird, I agree about the, yeah, so there's an interesting question. In biomedical ethics, consent is a requirement for um, intervening to save someone's life, right? Um, or to improve their welfare. Why, does, why isn't this a requirement in the case of an, wild animals, right? Um, are we permitted in just acting paternalistically towards them? Uh, that's an interesting, interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, Oscar, maybe we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's get back maybe in uh, 10 minutes. Max. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>